OK, I think um, we'll make a start given that numbers um, have plateaued. So um, hi, everyone, um, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, um, which will be focused on supply capacity envelopes and also migration plans and facilitated primarily by um, members of the programme migration team. Um, I'm just going to run through a little bit of housekeeping before we kick things off. So Rowan, if you wouldn't mind just moving on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so um, sort of in the usual format, we're going to use um, Slido to help facilitate um, with answering your questions throughout the course of this webinar. So please do use Slido. Um, to ask any questions that you have um, throughout the webinar. Um, you can join um, at slido.com um, and by entering the hashtag capacity envelopes passcode. Now we recognise that um, some of your questions may be quite technical given the topic that we're discussing today. So if you actually feel like it would be difficult to type in your question in Slido, please feel free to use the raise hand function and we'll look to answer any questions um, that way as well. So we've dedicated um, approximately 20 minutes um, to a Q&A at the end of the session to answer all of your questions in Slido. Um, and just to say that if we do end up timing out um, and some of your questions go un unanswered, we will look to answer those um, in a FAQ document that will be shared um, in follow up to today's session. Um, and just as well to flag that um, the session is being recorded um, and we will aim to publish both the recording and the accompanying slides um, in this week's issue of the clock, um, which comes out on Wednesday, um, if not beforehand. So Rowan, if you could just move us on and I will cover off the agenda. Oh, well, that slide there is a reminder for you to join at slido.com um, using the hashtag capacity envelopes. Thanks, Rowan. Then in terms of the agenda um, for today's session, um, so we are going to kick things off with a brief introduction, um, which will be led by my colleague Ian, who I will hand over to shortly. Um, Ian will then hand over to Alf, um, another member of the migration team, and Alf will take us through um, a worked example to help you all understand um, your capacity envelopes and also to provide some guidance on how to complete um, the migration plan. Um, and as I've said, we've then set aside some um, protected time to cover off all of your questions via Slido. Um, so I think that's everything from a housekeeping and agenda perspective. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Ian. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um... Welcome everybody and thanks thanks, thanks for joining the webinar. So I'll try and keep this very brief because I think the important thing is to get into the meat of this with Alf taking you through a worked example, but ju just, just to recap a, a couple of things, I think. Um, firstly, the session, the session today is dealing exclusively with capacity envelopes. We've obviously got two two considerations in in the term in terms of submitting the plans one 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 is where the plan is governed by a capacity envelope and one is where it's being governed by the de minimis rules so there's a there's a subsequent session where we'll be talking about some of the some of the detail around the de minimis rules submissions so today's focus will be upon capacity envelopes and obviously having gone through a series you know, two consultations now going through how we propose to apportion the finite capacity that, that is available within the network over the migration period. We, we collectively agreed on the, the principle of these capacity envelopes where we're effectively sharing sharing overall capacity with participants, you know, trying to apply the principles of, of fairness, equitable access and so on and so forth and trying, trying to provide as much flexibility as we possibly can. So th this is what under, underpins the material that's actually gone out for the first iteration of these these envelopes. Now, we, we are probably something to call out front and centre. We are very conscious of the fact that we've provided you with a lot of information and we we felt that was necessary because in, in, in t if we were to simply provide the, the very sim a very simplistic view of the envelopes with the 
weekly granularity it, it 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 can be it can be a bit opaque as to where some of those numbers have been derived so where 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 you see volatility in these weekly numbers due to the the, the fact that we will have non migration working days within a period for example we've tried to we've tried to be provide as much information as we possibly can to to, to try and sort of clarify clarify what these things are but we do realize that that comes at at a cost in terms of the amount of material that we have provided to you so hopefully we'll be able to clarify that today and I, I know that we'll be taking questions during the course of this and towards the end of the session but but obviously please do feel free to to reach out to the migration teams for our e email address should anything else uh, come up and, and obviously we'll be happy to talk to any subsequent queries as as well um i think that i think i'm probably going to keep this pretty brief because i think the, the important thing is to get into the next sec section that alf's going to take us through so i'm probably going to hand over to alf now uh unless there's any immediate or pressing questions that people people may have before we do so okay seems fine then so yeah i'm gonna hand over to my colleague alf now where we're gonna get into the meat of this so thanks very much thanks ian um good afternoon everyone and welcome so before we get too much into detail I'll just maybe just go over a high level what 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 was sent across and i think ian touched on there's a couple of folders there's a submission template folder which we're asking you to complete um where applicable some of these um these Excel files and I'll be walking through those in a moment. Um, also, we provided a guide and that guide will tell you if you need to refer back what which what, what all, each of those columns mean within each of these templates as I explain them. Um, so the first one is the, the primary submission that you have to fill in, which is your weekly level um granularity so at a weekly level we've aggregated the view of the capacity we're allocating per ldso for a given week and equally um, there's a column that will define whether that particular combination of the envelope mpid and the ldso mpid falls under the envelope submission rules or the de minimis submission rules. We'll be talking to the de minimis submission rules in tomorrow's webinar. Um, the next one is at a top level, the sort of the view of how we've defined what a de minimis LDSO is. And we've already had a, a couple of questions on this one. So there's a couple of criteria in which we define whether you fall into a de minimis submission I'll, and I'll touch on that again and we'll answer any questions if it's still not clear. Uh, the number C submission is where we have have a view of the supply MPIDs that you're seeking to qualify and also within your existing portfolio that we understand that would have to be considered uh, within any calculations that we that we create and that and there we have a mapping that shows our working out underneath that and that's something that we do ask you to verify um number d is the contact list so where we're providing this data we've already the ppc have already requested information from all suppliers to understand who are the key contact points for migration and we're also conscious of the fact that there are within a, several within a lot of organizations there could be splits across the organization and we're mindful of that we could be maybe overstating this but it's just making sure we've got a full view of all parties within an organization that are accountable or responsible for submitting the migration plans and the last one is where we need a view um or a list of the, the service providers you're seeking to engage and an indication. I know it's in probably for some participants, very early stages of what sort of percentage of the portfolio you, sh you know, that we're expecting to, you know, that they'll be used, they'll be used for, um, but for each of those service providers, according to the envelope MPID. So that's a very high, high level. This submissions will be asking for and, um, and that's what I'll be 
using as our worked example. And before I go into that, I could just maybe just the next couple of slides, just the next one. There's some information is provided and we can touch on these if we have time, but it's very much the underlying data, as Ian pointed out, that we've used to uh, derive and create these envelopes. Should, should you require that information, everything from the, the, the daily envelopes, the scaling factors, um, each how 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 we've considered industry ramp up or early life support um supply ramp up the core migration window those time dimensions um and then on to the next one next slide please the yeah and we've also got the the calendar days that we're using and the actual role descriptions that map to the dip roles so that's kind of a high level what we've provided you now if i just take over and start to share to go through a worked example what's like the work would look like so while i'm doing that has anybody got any questions or any or are there any questions on the line no questions in slido so far alf okay that's great can everybody see my screen okay yep so what we'd have so I've got several a worked example here with four different suppliers. So suppliers A are effectively SIT suppliers that are starting on the 7th of April 2025. And the DM1 is the minimum supplier and the EV1 is an envelope supplier. And the suppliers in the B tranche are starting on the 1st of October that year so we've got an envelope one and a de minimis one so we can kind of see those two examples i've got an overview of these suppliers before i get into so who what what do what, what do they look like at a macro level so the envelope supplier here we have considered that it has four four this supplier and sit supplier has four um, supply MPIDs that we've aggregated under AEV1 and there, there's the, the various different portfolios and that comes in at a total of um, about 7.6 million so that's that's a fairly large supplier and we can see that's that's how that envelope's comprised the diminished supplier that we'll be touching on tomorrow has 61,000 in total across three MPIDs and then the later one that we've got starting in October of us, as I said, has got a few more MPIDs that aggregate up to 5 million. And the small one that we'll be considering tomorrow has only got uh, 1,600. So that's our high level, the profiles at a macro level for, the, for these particular suppliers that we'll be considering today. So if we go into AEV1, which is our demo envelope, we can see that we've got the manifest that tells us all the files that's been delivered. And, you and that's fairly straightforward. And we can go into the submission template. And now I'll open, for the, for the purposes of this, we'll start with C, which is the mapping between, as I've just kind of showed you, at the high level, this is what we've provided you. And what we'd like you to just confirm our, our view, the MCC's view of the world from the data that we've got from, what that we received from, your pre-qualification sub submissions where applicable or the those that are participating in SIT, um, and, and for instance, and we would have a view of what are those supplier MPIDs and for that same organization. So we've got that mapping there. This is just a, an internal key that we will use if necessary to map back to our own internal database. And as we could see, that is the the total meter point count for 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 for, for each one of these. This is to be, this won't be in your current file. We'll be looking to add 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 these meter point counts in. So this is the the the, the total for all of them. That needs to be corrected. But we'll be, we'll be looking to provide that in the next one. You don't have that. Um, if we if you have a target migration date, will be um, that would have been provided from PQS, we'll be showing that as well in this file. And 
if you've indicated in your PQuest submission if that MPID is retiring. And we go all the way across. And all we'd look to see here is if you expect these are the only two columns that are effectively conditional. If you see there's a any discrepancy in any of the values that we provided here to the left, you would indicate that yes, there is a, there is a change. I, I believe there's something incorrect with the data. And what the comment is, I the there, you know, the fact is that you know this MPID is actually retiring or there's an MPID missing or whatever that we need to consider. And one of the examples we had is that what we had as the envelope MPID, they would rather have us make a different one of the MPIDs that we we've we've elected here. For instance, a seven should be the actual target MPID because the others will be um, retiring. And obviously, we we slightly got a little glitch in our data on that one. So that's the the mapping at a high level to make sure that you know, we've got that bit right. Are there any questions so far, Fran? No, none. None in Slido so far, and no hands. OK, fair enough. And I'll go to the the B submission. So the B submission, again, is a, another verification of data. But rather than looking at the consolidated view of supplier MPIDs to the envelope MPID, we're now looking at the level of what we've derived from our EES snapshot as of the 1st of June, as we laid out and when we sent you the envelopes and again all we're looking for is if you see any significant discrepancy in our meter point count trading uh meter point counts number of m trading m pounds that you have for that given ldso um just to to let us know and give us a comment so hopefully there shouldn't be anything there and that's fairly straightforward and again this is just sort of a gross error check to make sure that the data that's driving the envelopes looks good from your perspective. And then we get on to the actual submission, which is sheet A, which is the weekly envelope. And if I just open this up again, we've got the key there, which is an internal key, and it's very important for us that you know that you retain that. So that allows us to map back and validate and ingest into our system. So there's the envelope MPID, there's the LDSO MPID, and this is the week identifier. And the week identifier is comprised of the year, an ordinal week um, from the, you know, the beginning of the year, and the sprint indicator. Um, as stated, the sprints is our current view of the sprints, and they may be subject to change, and there's eight at the moment. And for this combination and this week, we actually um, we we know that the envelope rules apply, and this will be consistent for this particular LDSO. So if I was to filter, look at everything that's ELC for AEV1, we could see that that for the for the whole duration, there that is an envelope submission, all the way up to that date, which is the end of migration, all the way through. That's all the way through. So that allows me to sort of scan across and say, yes, I'm going to get an envelope for this one. So this follows the envelope rules rather than the minimus rules. So for this week, there's five migration, active migration days as defined in the migration calendar. Um, it's part of early life, because remember I said that this particular supply is starting on the 7th of April. And where those that are starting that are not part of early life and you're starting say for instance in October you'll be subject to a supplier ramp up period where there will be a scaling factor applied um, so effectively 10% of your normal allocation to ensure that I think we call it pipe cleaning is undertaken in, in a controlled manner before you, you ramp up to full capacity and that's just a pragmatic approach to ensure that everything's uh, working as expected and I think all suppliers would understand that and probably would follow that anyway but the migration envelopes would cover would, would actually show that as well and then there's a core migration window as we've said in the foundations in the principles document what we're expecting is that we're allocating six months of full capacity 
where we in where we would seek that the suppliers would migrate 90 percent of their portfolio within this core migration window and the reason for that is to ensure that you know all suppliers get a fair chance to migrate um what they want when they want and to allow flexibility to a certain extent as well as ensuring that we have sufficient capacity over the whole migration to meet the m15 milestone for this week we can see there's a start date and end date and then in the final two columns there's the most important columns for this week that's just, that's the weekly envelope that's been allocated and because this is actually during the early life period it's slightly smaller and as we stated for those of you that are SIP participants this is still under discussion these numbers during the early life period and so for instance if i was the supplier during the early life i would say actually i'm going to only migrate so that's five days um and that works out roughly what uh, 100 mig migrations per day i actually want to only operate on four so i'm going to say that's 400 for instance and equivalent for the for the next one is probably about roughly the same thing. I'm going to probably operate on four days, and so my migration is going to be probably around the region of. Sorry, oops. Be careful to fill in the right one. Seven thousand for that week, and so on. So that I would then fill in all the way down, and I could see obviously when I've finished the industry ramp up days four to zero that's the end of industry ramp up here and then we can see that we've um, hit the core migration window starts again there there's three days of core migration window so that's effectively where the core migration window starts so i could say here i know i'm starting my core migration so i know i need to be mindful of running at full capacity so here i'm probably perhaps thinking that actually i'm going to run as, as close as possible to that, so maybe something like 34,000 to run there, and th then I would complete that. And obviously, what I would probably be doing is filtering this by this particular LDSO MPID, and then I would complete everything for you'll see, and then I would actually then start again at week zero for EMEB, and that's the weekly envelope. Are there any questions? Yeah, actually, Alf, a couple of questions have come through on Slido. So should we cover those off? Yeah. And um, so one question I think is one that I can cover off. So Neil has asked how these slides will be distributed. So um, obviously, I know we've ran through a few slides at the beginning that are in the sort of PowerPoint presentation deck. So those slides will be made available across the collaboration base and the website. And um, we will send out an email um, to all participants, letting them know once they're available. Um, and we will also include an article in the clock on Wednesday. In terms of obviously ALF is doing this sort of demo, we'll also be sharing the recording as well. So you can revisit the recording um, to sort of walk through the elements that ALF is covering off here. Hopefully that answers your question, Neil. Um, then moving on to some more technical questions, ALF. So um, Lee's asked a question, does the guidance provide a description of each of the fields in the Excel templates we need to fill out? For example, the target migration date. Yes, it does. So within the guidance, there's a column by column breakdown. Um, equally, it tells you which columns of information provided by the MCC and which columns are required for submission. So we have a mandatory, optional and conditional indicators for this column. So in, in your template, you will see that column N, supplier planned um, submission volume, is actually a mandatory property in that guide. Perfect, thanks, Alf. And um, then Sarah has asked a question, what is classed as, signif as significant difference on sheet B? a few hundred or over a few thousand 
I, I think I'll jump in on this one because we've, we've, we've obviously taken the, the snapshots um, from industry portfolio data as at a point in time. And I can't, can't recall the exact date off the top of my head. I think we've communicated that. But, but I think if these look erroneous and looks like there's been an administrative error, I think that would be we recognise that they'll be churned from the point at which those those reports were taken to what they are today. So I think if we're, if we're, if we're seeing differences of hundreds or possibly even low thousands, depending upon portfolio, portfolio movement we, we probably don't need to be advised I think it's if if we have fundamentally made a mistake in the provision of those numbers yeah and then just for clarity the ESD data cut was at the beginning of June thanks Alf thanks Ian thanks Alf um, and then another question from Neil as well um, can we have an explanation of the possible values in each field which I think you've just said Alf is in the guidance document yeah of course um I mean, it's fairly straightforward. So obviously, this is the envelope MPID, as we described before, that we've allocated to. That's the all the LDSO MPIDs. The weak ID I've kind of gone through, which is a composite field, which is the year. And that increments, so say, week 15, 16, with the sprint allocation at the end. The is envelope rules, all of these, these two fields are boolean and actually mutually exclusive and you could you could argue that we could conflate this into one but i think just for simplicity we've made it two separate so hopefully that makes sense these properties here are just account so fairly straightforward for this given week we have a total number of five migration days total number of five ramp up days and total number of zero supply ramp up days and zero call migration windows days and in reality, what we're expecting is that we shouldn't never have more than five in here because obviously we don't have weekends as work migration days as well. The dates are fairly straightforward, I assume, and the envelope allocation is fairly straightforward. Um, I think for the other ones, um, we can you can perhaps refer to the guidance and obviously I'll be mindful to talk about any enumeration values, um, Neil, if that's what you're after as well. Um, and again, they're in the actual guidance as well. So that's the weekly uh, envelope. Now I can There's go... one more one more question, oh. Alf, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so Dom's um, submitted a question. So is it expected that supplier uh, plan submission volume sums exactly to our supply volumes, even those even those these are subject even though these are subject to change, or can it be approximate? So, I think I'll probably take. I'll take yeah, I'm just not sure whether they're yeah. talking about the envelopes or the you know, or the the actual submission volumes. It was a little bit unclear. So maybe you've got the question in front of you, Ian. No, no, I, I, I think I think we we do. I mean, Dom. I think we do we do recognise the fact that there is going to be churn here, but I think I think we have to treat these as a, as our points in time. So I think we we would probably want to see we would probably want to see that covered. Now, in reality, if it's you know, if it's twenty amp pounds short, we're probably we're probably not going to be jumping up and down about that. But, but we probably need it to be extremely extremely close. We know we know that these are going to be somewhat volatile and and where where that's going to crystallize i think a bit more is when we actually start getting into sprint execution and, and managing through the sprints but for the moment we'd probably we'd probably want those numbers to align yeah and, and that probably brings on an important point what we're asking for is weekly granularity we know that that these will be subject to change and there's a lot of uncertainty around this and the way that the migration framework is designed is that as Ian rightfully pointed out, those that are going to be participating when we actually start getting into sprint execution for the next period will actually be planning at a daily granularity. So that's when we're looking for a great uh, that degree of commitment. And we're only looking for daily granularity submissions for the sprint only. So it would only be the for two months. So that's that's when the the numbers would have to be, have a little bit more rigor around them. But at this this point, this is for us to understand the feasibility overall. If there's anything, you know, significant that we we need to consider that could be a challenge to the overall migration. So we need to get those the, those those high level numbers in. And then Al, another another questions come through as well. Ian, I don't know whether you wanted to come in there again. 
Yeah, I'll pick up on this one. So this, so this is this is the question from I think Ray. Will there will there be a test submission of, of some all of these templates to check we have understood what is expected and the program are getting what they need. So we're we're not going through an, an, an iteration of review within within this particular cycle. We are we are going to be doing a number of iter planning iterations as we go as as we approach the point at which migration actually starts. But I suppose what what going back to my earlier remarks at the top of the call if anyone does have any any questions or they would like to schedule in some time to go through a proposed submission to make sure to to, to, help, to help if you require our help to validate that then we'd, we'd be more than happy to support that so please please reach out thanks Aaron. just to say as well that the ppc can facilitate with that so if you've got a regular bilateral with a member of the ppc and it's something that you would like to cover off we can always um you know liaise with the migration team and pull someone into um that conversation to support with that that's great thanks fran okay i will now continue go on to the service provider submission form so under the service provider submission form what we're looking to do at this very early stage is get an understanding of what are those potential agent shares for, for, by LDSO that we're, you're, we're expecting to, to see. And we also know that this is effectively a blank canvas because we don't actually have, you know, the full list of service provider MPIDs or even their name. So we know if you look at the guidance that potentially you may not actually have the MPIDs or the role IDs, but you may just have the service provider name and you could sort of effectively say okay for this given this is my service provider whoever it is um energy solutions whatever you put the name in you could have a role id as defined in 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 the document and that will be an advanced state service provider for instance and etc cetera, etc cetera, based on the the dip the, the dip roles and you put that in there and that's fairly straightforward um what we mean by the service provider relationship type, that's whether that is a in-house um, agent or service provider or an external one. And it's just, again, it's either in-house or I think it's um, internal or external is the two values that we're looking to use. And then this value here that we're looking for you to provide is the share of that portfolio that you're expecting that service provider to service the demand for within that LDSO. So it could be a 50-50 split between two advanced data service providers. So that would be 0.5 and 0.5 in that example. And I would just, and this is just in these this these two columns effectively are just an outer join to help you sort of get started. So if I was to fill this in, I wouldn't actually use these values as just example values. So for this one, I'd say it's an advanced data service provider here. There's two service provider name, energy one, I can't spell. And then um, data service providers two, for instance, and that these are both, let's say, these would both be external. I'll just fill it in like that. And in this example, because it's covering 100% of the portfolio with a 50-50 split, I would just do 0.5 and 0.5. So hopefully that's fairly clear. And because these columns here are just sort of to show we need it, probably one data service provider, one uh, metering, uh, meter meter reading service for this particular one. We know that you still, ideally, you need to give us a meter reading service for this LDSO. So again, these aren't really needed for this submission. And okay, it's just kind of a reminder that, okay, I need a meter reading service for this one, for ELC, so there's a meter reading service. And again, it could be a different split for these two, and I could even have a third one, which is in-house, which is probably unlikely, but anyway. And so this one would say internal. These would be 
external. And for this example, I could say that the in-house one has the lion's share, and then it's just a split between the other two that's even on those. And if there's any comments that you need to support, that would be useful. I think I'm probably just would probably just add to this is that we do we do we do recognize that there, there could be still some uncertainty in this space so i think what we're keen to just capture is is people's best understanding at the moment as well because we've, we've we've obviously got the requirement to try and ag aggregate this and, and get get a, a view of potential load upon individual agents so that we can have those discussions but we do we, we probably we do we, we do absolutely recognize that at this point some of this may still be uncertain so we're we're, we're really just seeking your your most up-to-date position uh, on this at the moment with with the understanding that this is this may well change so i just wanted to be be clear about that i think we 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 know that there might be a level of precision here that that's simply not possible at this point in time and then to that point, here on. Sorry, no, you go, Alf. And to that point, where possible, if there is an MPID existing, that helps us to correlate that much better than just the service provider name, which is a little bit harder for us to do. Just to say there are a couple of questions. Is now a good time to pause just to answer a few? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, good. okay. Um, so John's asked a question. Um, and I think, Ian, you've partly answered this already, but we may not have agreed any commercials for an external service provider by the submission date. Do we leave blank? I think leaving I think leaving blank is acceptable for the moment. If, if we can, if we can, we will infer that if it's blank, that it's it's not known. So, yeah, I mean, you could even just add the the fact in the comment that for instance, you could just say not known or something for that given combination. OK, that thank would be you. useful. Yeah. Um, and then um, this question relates to template E. So um, is the service provider MPID the one which is being utilised under MHHS arrangements opposed to their current live MPID? We. Ideally, we'd like to trap what the what the M, the the MPID under the MHHS arrangements will be. But even if we can capture the organisation, that that will that will give us intelligence because I can't recall off the top of my head whether those MPIDs will be knowable for everybody at this point. But if that that's what we're seeking to capture, and if it's if it's not available, then just the organisation will probably be sufficient at this point. Yeah. Okay, that's all that's in Slido at the moment. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Fran. And then I'll just move on to the contact information. And again, you've already provided this information um, previously um, in a request for, for those contacts, but we are fully cognizant of the fact that we still have some gaps um, with some suppliers that um, haven't responded to us yet. So what we this is an opportunity for us to, one, um, capture that information that we don't have and that if we look at this we can see this we've got the primary contact um, for, for this um, da -da -da, is it? For, for your envelope which is EV1 and the primary contact name would be I just got uh, this would be whatever their name is and the email there and we've just got a an active from and an active to date. This is for our data integrity, showing it's active. There's the envelope input and the, the actual underneath it, the supply input. So, where well, those of you who have supplied provided one name for a given um, supplier input, we've just effectively exploded that to include all supplier inputs, and that just allows us to sort of validate that we've got all the right contacts at the supplier input level. And we just where there's a say a deviation and you have a they say for instance for this particular AV9 you've got a different contact. Um Peter other and you'd also change the email to P dot other or something like that. And that would then change, and I'll just indicate across here that I've made a change here, and diff different contact. 
for a E V nine. So it's fairly straightforward that information. So that just allows us to validate the the contacts that we have, and is no and what we have is correct and accurate. Equally, it we know that organisations have um, new starters and leavers and so on and so forth. So it's keeping track of those. Obviously, if, if an existing person has left, so this one could have changed. We just say that that is no longer active and inactive. So actually, I just say this one, uh, this person particularly finished on say the fourth of August. They they change jobs on a on a Sunday, which is probably not realistic. Um, they became inactive, which is one of the other values in here. And again, all I would do is indicate on this row that I've made a change and I can make a comment no longer in organization. And this allows us to keep track um of all the right contacts and keep our database up to date that's the contact sheet now just looking at time and we said what we've got 20 minutes for questions and answers i think because now, Alf, we're addressing them as we go it probably doesn't matter as much but there is also just a question here from richard and um, he's asked if you wouldn't mind just going back to sheet e and recovering column H and how to complete column H. Okay, just a moment. Of course. So column H on yes. sheet E. So the probably the simplest way to do this is based on a given service provider role and LDSO combination, we would expect a 100% share of that um, particular um, data service, that particular service, so the advanced data service provider here, we would look to say of that particular portfolio within that LDSO, there's 100% coverage we're looking for. So I'm going to hide these because it's probably confusing. You're probably best off deleting these anyway because that's just for guidance so i'm just interested in up to columns h so, so column h for my advanced data service providers i want 100 coverage which would add up to one and that's what all i'm saying is that's the the actual share between these two service providers within within that ldso and this is another example for the meter read service provider I've got three, and again, adding up to one, I've got a share for my internal one of 60%, a share for DSP2 of 20%, and a share for Energy One, providing 20% share of across that region for EELC. And again, I'll repeat that for the other LDSO regions. Is that clear? Or was that, do, do I need, if I... No, it looks like we've had some thumbs up. So I think that's okay. probably clear. Thanks, Alf. Okay. That's cool. So there's also just um, another question that's come in from John. Um, please, can you remind me of the name of the guidance document? Thank you. So the guidance document is in, there's a link that's provided and it's yeah. the, I can't remember Let the exact me... name. I can find that in the background and I'll just pop it in the um, chat. You carry yeah. on, Alf. Thanks, Fran. Yeah. And there'll be a link to it. Hopefully you'll provide that as well. So. OK, so that's that's all the submission forms um, so far we go through. So I think it probably would be wise just to maybe just have a look at a de minimis one. So this is a de minimis supplier or maybe I'll, I'll look at the First, before doing that, I'll look at the supplier starting in October. So this the one starting in October, if we look at the combination here on C, just for an example, we can see that the PQS migration start date is shown here as the 7th of October. 
and what we've actually derived here from the PP from the Migration Control Center, we've aligned this, what they provided from the seventh, and we made that the first. And the reason we've done that is that with the Migration Control Center, we want all suppliers just from the way our tool is working at the moment, starting on the first of a month, because it simplifies the, the calculations for the scaling, et cetera, et cetera. And once you factor in migration working days, non-working days, contract rounds, it levels out anyway. Hopefully that makes sense. So this is the one starting in that and they're getting an envelope. And if I open it up, maybe it's worth just having a quick look at the de minimis one, just, just to show this the slight so ever such subtle difference. And if I'm looking at the weekly envelope, what you'll see is under here, there's a de minimis flag saying it falls under the de minimis rules at the LDSO level. And because of that, and this will, will be touching on what does that mean for your submissions tomorrow? We can see that the weekly envelope is actually zero here. But it is actually a de minimis rule for that particular uh, envelope LDSO combination. I suppose now let's have a look and we could probably now for the envelope one go into the actual information. So what's the information files that we provided? So based on conversations we've had with many suppliers, what we found is that this level of information in terms of how we've actually calculated those weekly envelopes um, would be of value because some of them are actually trying to derive this anyway. So if we if we provide it, it saves that little bit of work anyway. And this is the the actual source of truth. So we can see for the first week there are um, yep, there's seven days there. So that's a seven standard days that happen in the week there's the ordinal day number and this is obviously repeated all the way for that combination that there's an envelope required is whether it's a migration day so we can see there's five migration days there's a two weekend days where it's a zero um there's actually the industry wrap five industry wrap-up days nothing happening on the weekend they're not in supplier ramp up they're not call migration window yet. And then we saw for the first example, then when we added it up, it was 500. And there we go. We've got the individual 100 days for those for that first week. So that, that all makes sense and works out. And I could scroll all the way down and see the other LDSO combinations. So here I've got ELC. If I was to go further down, I'd see other LDSOs as well with those combinations. And this is almost foreshadowing that when we actually get to daily planning, we would just be adding a column here saying, what what is the daily submission and expecting you to fill that in. But there's a We've got a few iterations to go before we start requesting that and only for those that will be actively migration migrating and this sheet would only be for two months anyway for the sprint execution when we get to that daily granularity it would still provide the full data for the whole migration period but for in terms of the actual submission it would only be a shorter window anyway so that's the daily level can we pause Any... for a couple of questions, Alf? Is that of OK? Course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Dom has asked a question. Following the initial submission and feasibility, when will the next iteration be and how often will you require updates? Is there a process or bounds on big changes? Good question. So, so <clears throat> hang on, then. You go. Yeah, sorry, jumping on that, Dom. We, we're, pro we're, we're probably... We we are not going to seek to ban that because we're we're, see, we're seeking your best view at the moment. Now, if now if circumstances change in the interim between now and the next submission, then then they change, and we would just ask you to reflect reflect that uh, within the plan. And because we're not we're not exercising the unused capacity process at the moment, that 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 probably that, that probably doesn't 
have any impact i mean we're, we're seeking best views at various points in time and with regard to the question as to when the next submission is i'll have to go away and go through the planet and publish that in the q and i don't have that on my fingertips but we'll we will answer that that point but we're not seeking to say we you may not deviate more than 10 percent from what your initial submission is if, if something does change in the interim then then we would we would have to be able to sort of respond and deal with that so I hope hope that covers it. We're not seek we, we we wouldn't be seeking to put rules on that. I don't think. I think Brilliant. we ha we have to distinguish between mm. what we're asking for a weekly submission, which is you know it has that inherent flexibility and understanding that things do change, but as we get closer to that migration execution period, when we ask for a daily submission, that is effectively when we form a commitment to those volumes that you're submitting. So hopefully that makes sense. OK, thanks, Ian and Alf. Um, Sarah's asked a question. So for sheet E, assuming we provide both customer and supplier appointed agents. It would be fabulous if we could get a view about what about what you think that looks like. Yes. Now we recognise that that may be problematic. So so again, the, the, the best view that we can get at the moment would be would be sort of extraordinarily valuable to us at the moment. OK, great. Thanks, Ian. Um, Dom's asked another question. So what is the de minimis rule? Do you want us to populate submission volumes for de minimis LDSOs? So I'll, 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 a couple of points to pick up here. Um, so de minimis rule. So the, fundamentally, the principle that we're applying here is that if your portfolio within an L, if you if as a supplier, your portfolio within an individual LDSO is greater than 35,000, your plan, your plan will be guided by a capacity envelope. So we have been talking about these daily and weekly values, and we're asking that your submissions remain in the bounds of, of that capacity envelope. So so the, so where we talk about de minimis, the, the rules in which your submissions to uh, need to adhere to are slightly different. You will need to create a submission for de minimis uh, portfolios, i.e. where your portfolio is less than 35,000 within an LDSO. And tomorrow's webinar will, will be going through the detail about what those rules are as distinct to um, capacity envelopes. But the, fundamentally, the principle is, is, is if, you, if you're subject to an envelope, you at the day, at the weekly and daily levels in, in due course, you, you'd need to adhere in your submissions to those to those values. The rules are slightly different for the de minimis submissions. But but tomorrow we'll go into the detail about about what I, what that is. The nature of the submission doesn't alter hugely. It's just the rules that that submission it, it needs to adhere to are, are are the differentiator. OK, thanks, yeah. Ian. Alf, sorry, were you going to add something to that? Um, no, I think it's pretty much covered. I mean, obviously, there's there's reasons for it that we did cover in the working group and a lot of it's to do with we do understand when we get to those smaller portfolios it's, it's it ends up being vanishingly small numbers that we're issuing as envelopes so it doesn't make sense so therefore we offer a different kind of flexibility around that okay, great. Um, so so i think moving moving on i think probably makes sense to pick up richard's question next round there was yeah. a reference to another webinar tomorrow. Is this relevant to all large suppliers? So, the the answer may may be yes or no, Richard. And I can't recall off the top of my head what your portfolio looks like. But but for fundament, fundamentally, the rule as to whether um, a portfolio requires an envelope or a de minimis submission is is at the LDSO level. So, it, it it's likely that you will have portfolios that. LDSOs for which your portfolio is going to be governed by an envelope and similarly it's likely you'll have portfolios that will be governed by de minimis rules so if if you as a supplier have uh, a portfolio account less than 35,000 within an individual LDSO or you've got or you've got um MPANs within an LDSO that's deemed to be de minimis then then it probably will be relevant to you okay thanks Ian um, and then Kai, apologies, Kai, if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, but have all envelopes, weekly submission templates and passwords been sent to suppliers? Yes, is a short answer. So they were sent out, uh, if I'm not correct, last Wednesday. 
Um, so you should have received them or your primary contact. If you haven't, please get in contact with um, the migration mailbox and we'll, we'll look to try and find out what, what's happened to that and also verify that we've, you know, the, who is your contact point because they may have it and not notified you. So we can carry out that investigation. OK, thanks, Alf. And then Richard, just seeing your follow up question, um, I will forward the invite for tomorrow's webinar to you. So don't worry about that. You'll get that. And if there's anyone else on the call that feels that they should have been invited or need to come along to tomorrow's webinar, please feel free, free to um, contact the PPC mailbox um, and we'll just make sure that you get that forwarded on to you so that you can attend. I think, um, Alf, was there anything um, sort of really important for you to cover off? No, I was just going through the data files. That was all that we I wasn't, you know, just while we had time. But I think it's fairly self-explanatory, the remaining data files that we have. Um, the only one that might need a little bit of explanation is C. So this one. So this is showing for this particular example of this supplier, um, AEV1, um, their actual portfolios, as we've calculated it based on EES data across each of the LDSOs as columns here, but we've split it down by is it in industry ramp up? So that's the portfolio that's we're expecting for this period between these two dates in industry ramp up for ELC. And then obviously in the core migration window for ELC, which is now that flag is enabled, but no longer in industry ramp up. And that's when the, the core migration window starts. I can see that clearly here from the 1st of July to the 31st of December. And that's the submission that we've calculated that will be their core migration submission, and that will inform the supplier. And we do understand that, you know, we, we've seek as much as possible to allow at least 20% headroom, so that's 120% of their portfolio. Total portfolio should be allocated in that period. That's what we seek to do in the majority of cases. Some cases we've not been able to do that because it's a smaller LDSO. And then the, t the long tail of their migration is effectively after the industry ramp up, after their supplier ramp up, and after the core migration, that start for this example, it's starting on the 1st of January, running till the end of migration, and that's the, the long tail. So they still have a reasonable um, number of available migrations in their uh, envelopes. OK, brilliant. I think um, in the interest of time, Alf, we've just got one minute left, so um, I will um, close things out. But just to say a massive thank you to all of you for joining today's webinar and to the migration team for facilitating. Um, we have managed to run through all of the questions submitted to Slido, but appreciate some of you may have further questions once you've had a chance to sort of review the material from today. So feel free to direct those questions um, to the migration team via the migration mailbox. And um, equally, you can always direct your questions via the PPC team as well. So through the um, PPC mailbox, and we will forward those on to the migration team. And um, just to quickly recap, we will be providing um, the slides from today as well as the recording and um, we'll send out an email with those um, and we will be publishing them to the collaboration base and also the website. Um, and then I also just wanted to flag that the migration team are also facilitating a number of drop in sessions. Um, starting from next week um, and you can bring sort of any specific questions that you have around your individual um, capacity envelopes and migration plans to those sessions um, and they'll be very happy to sort of answer your questions in those sessions as well. Um, so hopefully um, that was a helpful session for you all um, and we'll see some of you I'm sure at the um, webinar tomorrow as well. So thanks very much everyone um, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Bye-bye.